joy to be able to introduce um, our speakers this morning. You know, uh, one of the one of my favorite Jehovah names. You know, in the Bible, there's a whole bunch of names uh, for God, and and there's a whole list of Jehovah names: Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, uh, many, many Jehovah names. And and I think my favorite, one of my favorite ones is is Jehovah Shema. Jehovah Shema. What, anybody know what that one means? The Lord is here. That's right. The Lord is here. The Lord is there. The, Lord, the presence of God. Jehovah Shema. God, and wherever you are, God is there. In fact, you know what? Just turn to the person next to you and tell them that. Wherever you are, God's there. Go ahead. Tell them that. <laughs> Amen. There are people um, that I, I think that God, uh, in, in his wisdom and in his love for us, there are people that, that function in the kingdom uh, and in this world uh, to shine in that particular way, that to, to show other people that God is there. The Lord's here. The Lord's with you. God's, God's with you right now. Amen? But there are people that have that, and it's more than just, you know, we all know that. It's one of those facts that you learn uh, that God is always everywhere and, 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 and he loves us and he's there. But then there are people that, that the Lord just gives a special gifting, a special anointing that when they, when they serve, when they serve the Lord, the, the people that they serve know in, a, in their knower. How many have a knower? Nobody raised their hand. Oh, my goodness. It's, it's where you know beyond just in your mind, you know down here, God is, God is here. God's, God's got this. God's with me. God's got this. And Carl Lindelin is one of those. He's one of those Jehovah Shammah guys. He's probably never been called that before, but, but that's the, the way I see his ministry. When he walked into the hospital room when, when Jack was going through his, uh, his uh, journey, and, and it was very tough, and and when Carl walked into the room, I, ha I had that sense, Jehovah Shema, the Lord is here, the Lord is here. There's nothing magic about him, there's, you know, not like that, a little crazy, but not, not, uh, but, but he just carries with him that, that wonderful presence of the Lord that is so needed in those dark times. And we all go through dark times, don't we? And when those people come across our path, and he, through them, the Lord just assures us, God, God's here. The Lord is here. Hallelujah. And, I, and as we were going through this last week, I was struggling. I was really struggling because Steve, Steve is more than just a, another. Steve is my friend. He was, he was, we, we, he was my friend. And, and, uh, when I thought about today, I thought, God, what could we do? Because I'm, I, I don't know where I'm at, um, just in terms of uh, emotionally and those kind of things. And and I thought, I know, there's a guy who walks around, and when you, when you meet him, when you're around him very long, you know Jehovah Shema. And I wanted him to come and share with us this morning and minister to us. Amen. So let's welcome Carl Lindelin as he comes to ministry this morning. Phone. There we go. All right. Great, great, great. Hey, it's good to see everyone. Wow. Turn to the person next to you and say, you sure look good today. Turn to the other person next to you and say, I'm glad you're sitting next to me. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be sitting by myself. Well, anyway, I have the great opportunity of uh, being our district uh, chaplain. So I call them the 22 Metro Hospitals, Rochester, Mayo, um, and uh, a bunch of other hospitals, wherever there's a, a minister or a church member. Um, that needs some help, uh, I go and 
pray with them, and uh, we see God do tremendous things. And uh, I was just thinking, thank God for Little River. I'm so thankful for healthy babies. Because you see, I'm at five children's hospitals each week praying for babies in the NICU and the PICU. And I am so thankful every time there's a little baby that's born that is healthy and strong. And so God bless you. And look at all the family. Wow. How do y'all get to be so good looking? <laughs> wow, that is something. Anyway, there's a pastor in our, in our district who um, he's building a $4 million children's wing onto his building. Now, how many of you know that that's a pretty big nut to crack? Four million dollars. <clears throat> well, he was down in um, Anaheim for our general council. Every two years we meet uh, in the Assemblies of God and we vote on things and we make sure that there's order and new people are elected and it's kind of a big deal. But it takes our pastors away for five to seven days um, and some of them extended since it was in Anaheim. A lot of people extended, went to visit Mickey and a few other people. Um, but uh, our pastor there called me because he had three babies in the church who were in the NICU, two at Masonic and one at Children's Hospital. Little five-year-old at Children's Hospital <clears throat> um, was told by the doctors that she had Lyme's disease and that it had moved to the brain and that there was nothing that they could do for this little girl. So Pastor Denny called me and said, could you please go and visit? I said, absolutely. I'd been doing that for two years. This is the kind of pastor, much like your own, who loves to go to the hospital and be with his people. Um, but he's in Anaheim, California. So I go and I visit this, this mother and this little five-year-old girl. And there's been no hope. We love medicine. We love doctors. But how many of you know that faith and doctors work together? You know, we're not against the uh, medical science, but they work with faith, and it helps us. And so the doctors had, there's nothing more we can do, you know. Um, it's moved into the brain, and there's nothing we can do. You know, it's just a matter of months. And uh, so Pastor Denny called me. I went in, introduced myself. You know, Pastor Denny asked me to visit you. He's in Anaheim, California, but I'm here to pray with you. And I started talking with a little five-year-old girl, and pretty soon, you're never going to guess what happened. We started laughing and having fun, and we just forgot all about what the doctors had said. And then we prayed together, and we prayed a very simple prayer. Jesus, bring healing and restoration. Amen. And I left, and this mother got on Facebook and said, I have the best pastor in the world. He's in California, but he sent a chaplain to come and pray with me, and we laughed for the first time in a week. And we had such a good time. Well, guess what? This little girl went home from the hospital two days later. Healed by the power of the blood of Jesus. <laughs> to God be the glory. Now, here's the best part. Well, not only did she get healed, that was a great, great miracle of God. But Pastor Denny, remember, it's a $4 million building that they're building for their children. That's why it was no coincidence that he had three in the children's hospital while he was in California. And don't worry, the other two are, one of them has gone home and I prayed with the one on Friday. 
and uh, they're doing better too. So they'll be going home soon. But a month went by, and this mother brought a check from her father for the building. Now, he's a Roman Catholic, and he's never even been to the church, but he gave the largest gift towards that building for $250,000. Do you see how God takes care of us? Now, I told Pastor Denny I'd get a 10%. But I don't think he listens. So, but anyway, I have the opportunity of praying and and believing with God for all kinds of things, and we've seen so many things uh, where God supernaturally reaches down from heaven and touches and brings healing. And um, I always pray up with people. How many of you know what I mean when I pray up with people? I always pray like they're believers, and uh, that's why I wear uh, a clerical collar, uh, because I can take confessions, and, uh, oh, I didn't get much of a laugh there, did I? <laughs> um, no, but they know why I'm there in the clinical, you know, in hospitals and things, they know why. And they'll ask me, they'll say, uh, in elevators, parking ramps, uh, restrooms, uh, men's restrooms. <laughs> I better clarify that. Um, but they know why I'm there, and they, I'll ask them if they'd like prayer. Yes, they always say yes when I ask, can I pray with you? Yes. When we pray, I pray like they're believers, and then at the end they always say, you know, I don't think I'm a believer. Oh, you could be. Would you like to be? And guess what they usually respond back with? Yes. You know why? Because you bring God the Father... Jesus the Son and God the Holy Spirit with you everywhere you go. You don't just bring him with on Sunday morning or Wednesday night. He's with you at um, he's with you in the John Deere tractor and he's with you at Walmart. I don't know if he's with you at uh, Senex or not, but no, he's with you. He never leaves you. He never forgets about you. And guess what? He's the one that strengthens you, encourages you, and helps you. And it's all through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's why it's so precious. And so please, you know, I can never leave home without him. I'll be driving, you know, around the metro interstates. And um, people always are in such a hurry today. They drive by and tell me I'm number one, <laughs> and I just say, yes, I am. God bless you. And then I meet them at the next stoplight or the next exit ramp. So um, it's really kind of fun the way that that works, but um, I am so thankful. Now, how many of you know that all of our Old Testament heroes faced a few challenges in their life? How many of you know that it wasn't easy for Moses? How many of you know that uh, one of the guys I relate to really well, his name was Job? And how many of you know that he had to go through some, some uh, journeys in life that he really didn't want to be on? Now, how many of you love packing for a trip? Yeah, you like packing your suitcase and everything, getting ready, making sure you got everything you need. Uh, how many of you love packing when you don't know where you're going? <laughs> My beautiful wife, Miss Dee Dee, you'll see her in just a few minutes. She loves to know what we're doing on vacation. She wants to know what clothes she has to bring. And uh, how many of you women are the same way? I was so glad that the Reverend Mother got our dress code today. 
Yeah, it's so good. Don't you love when the Holy Ghost just helps you? And then, it, it, you know, God is in heaven just having a good time laughing. He loves us. He cares about us. And, you know, when he surprises us like that, he just kind of says, I knew they'd never get it. <laughs> you know, it's fun. Well, when, when we go on a, on a journey, I was on a 10-year faith journey with my wife. And I had no idea where we were going or even how long the trip was going to take. How many of you are type A where you have to know exactly the time of everything every day and you want to make sure that uh, you've got directions to every place every day and some of you even plan the restaurants you're going to eat at when you're on vacation. Uh, Mine is easy, McDonald's. I mean... (laughs) They're everywhere, and its food quality is the same. Um, So we're not live streaming this, are we? Okay, good. I better be careful. Um, But, you know, when we go on these journeys, we don't know how long it's going to last. Our faith journey was more than 10 years And we didn't think it was going to be more than something very small, a weekend, you know. uh, But if you'll just have the right attitude, watch and see what happens. I was terminally ill for seven years. For seven years, the doctor said, there's nothing more we can do. Uh, They wanted to put me in hospice care. Uh, they wanted to put me in comfort care. They wanted to give me Obamacare. <laughs> and, and I said, no, I want Jesus care. That's the best kind of care to have, Jesus care. And uh, how many of you have ever seen the $6 million man, uh, Lee Majors? A couple of us. We're showing our age, aren't we? <laughs> Boy, it's a good thing I trim this up. Otherwise, in another month, Kids look at me real funny. (laughs) Anyway, our insurance company paid over $6 million for my health care coverage for a 10-year period of time. I am so thankful that we have uh, insurance through Miss Didi's work. Because otherwise, you see, when you're old or terminally ill, this is how much the government gives you. Why waste money? He's going to die. So this is how much they would have given me. And I am so thankful for the medical staff and doctors and nurses. I had 10 specialists at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I had... um, uh, Such a great, great time. I spent three months every year for 10 years. So three out of 10 years I was spent at that hospital. I spent every holiday there. You know, I, we, we know everybody from George in the transport department to Deb the receptionist. Uh, It's so funny because today I make a call at the hospital I was in surgery uh, Monday morning with one of our ministers, and uh, the anesthesiologist came in. We're in the pre-op room. Carl, so good to see you. But I'm used to seeing you in a gown and laying here. I said, I know, I know, but I'm here to help now. And, oh, yes, we know. And then when the surgeon walked in, he comes in and gives me a big hug Dr. Bielman, he says, Carl, it's so good that you're here. I said, well, you're going to take care of Daisy, aren't you? Oh, yes, the patient, you know, and she was kind of nervous about the whole thing. She had no family, and uh, all of a sudden, because of the anesthesiologist knew me and because uh, the doctor came in and gave me a big hug, that surgeon had only cut me open three times, so... (laughs) I have a lot of faith in the guy. Uh, she, she all of a sudden just saw relief. She knew she was in good hands. 
And Dr. Beelman looked at Daisy and said, don't worry, you're going to be family after I get done with this eight-hour surgery. And guess what? I saw her on Wednesday, and then I saw her on Friday. And when she went to the transport, <clears throat> I mean the transplant unit, I went up to one of the nurses, because I know most of the nurses, and I said, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Becky, do you have Daisy as one of your patients? She said, yes. I said, oh, good, I've got to see her. Oh, yes, come on in. So we went in the room together, and we started talking and visiting with Daisy. All of a sudden, this relief came upon her again because she knew she was being cared for by somebody great. When we walked out of the hospital room, Becky looks at me and said, I should have known she was one of you. She's got the same spirit and the same attitude as you. Now, this is the same nurse that came up to me. Are we live streaming? <laughs> I got to be really careful. Um, this is the same nurse that came up to me and said, I believe in God because of what I saw him do in you. I believe in God because of what I saw him do in you. And so I'm here to tell you that every time we go through something, it may not be the funnest experience, but every time I've gone through something in that 10-year faith journey, something good has come out of it later because I've been able to help others go through it themselves. And how many of you know that experience is one of the best things? Now, do you like going through bad things? How many of you know that bad things happen to good people? Turn to the person next to you and say, he's reading my mail. <laughs> no, it just happens. And the blessing is, is that we can stand on his word and we can live by his word. I am so thankful that God hears our prayers. You know, they don't just float up in the clouds and then fall back down onto earth. No, they're heard in heaven. Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father, interceding, praying, helping us. Turn to the person next to you and say, I have a great helper. God and my spouse. Wait a minute. Some of you women didn't say that. <laughs> Don't be so nitpicky. No. Well, um, like I say, we went through such a journey. I had 24 major health issues that we went through together. And uh, one of them uh, was when I died eight years ago. And I went down for a very simple procedure. And uh, uh, sometimes you ask yourself, why did that happen? I just said, how can I help somebody after I've gone through this? How can I help somebody? I don't ask why. I just say, how can I rather than why? Because why is such a... Yeah, yeah, how many of you have teenagers? What's the worst thing you can ask them? Why? Because you're not going to get a response or you're going to get something bad. So anyway, Miss Didi, come on up and share with us, if you would, about your... Uh, she tells us a lot better than I was because I wasn't be breathing at the time. Yeah. Um, yep, Carl's right. He went down... Um, he, what he didn't tell you is that Carl didn't eat anything for seven years by mouth. So I feel, so he had um, a pick line, which was a line that I would hook up TPN eight in the morning and it would run till eight at night and then I would repeat it once I got home from work and we'd start the process. So for seven years, he couldn't eat anything by mouth. His, his digestive system had shut down. So there was no eating um, by mouth and so that TPN was keeping him alive. Well, this stay at the hospital, this particular stay said, that they said he had a blood clot. They had to pull the line out and put a new one in, which he had had done half dozen times or more. 
And so I had left to go to work, and because I never left, um, I used to stay at night um, and be with him in the evenings. And then, um, so I left to go to work, and by the time I got to work, I had gotten set up at my station, and, um, and I got a call that said I needed to come back. And she said that um, Sherry, the physician's assistant at Didi, Carl coded um, this morning, and I said, you mean respiratory coded? You know, overhead you hear that code blue, and a lot of times it's a respiratory code, meaning the person's had a procedure or someone's having a hard time breathing, or so they want to stabilize him. No, she said not this time. She said he flatline coded. It's been gone 15 minutes. We have we, we don't have him stable yet. You just need to get here. So I got in the car, and on the way in I called. There's power in prayer, and I've learned that there is power in prayer. And on my way, any time we went to the hospital, I'd call our district office, and I'd ask them to send out a prayer request to all the pastors in our district to pray for my husband and pray for our situation. And that's what they, they would do. And he was on the prayer list for years, so he holds the record. You know, if you want to say record for you by people that are competitive. Anyway, and so um, he does hold the record. And so they, um, so I went down there, and for five days, Carl was in intensive care on life support. And during that stay there, ICU, the many times that he's been there, is a horrific, horrifying, I mean, it is terrible because there was two, at the U, there's two, on the fourth floor, there's two waiting areas, um, and they're full of people who are losing their loved ones, their children, their parents, and it is just agonizing, and it's not, when you're going through your own uh, journey, it's hard to go in there. Me, I always want to build everybody else up, and I found myself in the hallway uh, between those two lounges this particular time, um, just struggling and asking God, like, what is going on? And, you know, I want to share something with you. You know, I felt every emotion. I was bitter. I was hurt. I was sad. I was depressed. I was all of those, emo all those emotions I experienced. The Holy Spirit reminded me that it was okay for me to feel those emotions, but it wasn't okay to stay there. So I chose not to stay there, and when I would feel them and knew that it was coming on, I right away pressed in because the Word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I chose to trust God and have faith. And during that faith walk, if the ushers would come, I, I, I have um, this vial, and they're full, it's just a little vial, and I'll, you'll see one because you're all going to get one. It's full of mustard seed. And um, sometimes that's all the faith I had. Go you ahead. can take these and start handing them out. Sometimes this is just, as, I didn't have much more faith than this, but I relied on our pastors and our pastor's wives to pray for me and lift me up during some of these times. And the Lord reminded me, I just needed, a, I, that's all the faith I needed, and I trusted him to get me through. And the one scripture that carried me through this whole journey was do not grow weary for doing good don't grow weary so i kind of my spirit man stayed high and i trusted the lord but i carried this everywhere i had one at my station had one in my purse i carried it everywhere just as a reminder of the faith um, that i had in the lord so with that said i went this fifth day carl was still on life support they didn't know what they you know had him all his brain and they had all that stuff hooked up they weren't really sure the prognosis. They knew that I couldn't take him off of life support because he wasn't able. Every day they camp, they'd come in and they'd test his breathing, like they'd take some of the sedation off, see if he could breathe, breathe on his own, and he couldn't. And so um, I was in the court. I want to step back. I was in the between these two waiting areas, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And if it was an audible voice, if I've ever heard one, it was then, and it said, "You got to take Carl off of life support." And I, my first thing was to argue with the Holy Spirit was my children aren't here. I have two grown daughters and seven grandchildren, and I knew that God was faithful, but I, was, I just questioned that second, not questioned, but said, but my kids aren't here. And he said, take him off a of life support. So with that being said, I, I never was afraid of death because I said to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. And I knew that my ultimate goal to all of ours is to go be with Jesus. And I wanted to please the Lord. I was in the God-pleasing business. I feel like we are, and I wanted to please the Lord. So I never got fearful during Carl's journey. I got worried and concerned, but I never got fearful. The fear that I had was wanting to please the Lord, 
Lord, please, I just want to please you. Just guide me, lead me. I just, was, I just wanted to please the Lord. I wanted him to tell me one day, well done, good and faithful servant. That's all I want. I didn't do that because he was my husband. I didn't take care of him. I, I, I could have put him in long-term care. They would have taken care of him. I could have just gone on. I didn't do all of this because of that. I took a vow when I was married to my husband, and it was for sick, in sickness and in health. And that's the, what I held on to because I wanted to please God. I wanted him to get me through the process, and he did. Um, this particular day, I went in there. I told the nurse, I said, I want Carl to be taken off of life support. And she looked at me, and she said, Dee Dee, you can't just do that. She goes, what do you have in place? What does he have in place? What's his DNA? A whole, because, you know, they have to cross their T's and dot their I's. And I said, I need to take him off. You don't understand. He needs to be off. Went to the charge nurse. The charge nurse called the doctor. The doctor called the social worker because they want to make sure that you're sound mind. And yes, and everybody's coming, and they all come, and they come with the clipboard, and you're signing papers after papers. And so anyway, with that being said, they said, OK. And after, I don't know, it was a long time, they um, pulled the curtain, pulled the glass door. I sat on the other side of the glass door, and um, they pulled him off. I heard the gurgling and all the suction and the breaths. Just yeah, anyway, to make a long story short, he, they took him off. He started breathing on his own. And I walked in thinking, after they did all that, you know, they were still working on him, walked in and as soon as I could, and I thought he was going to be so happy to see me, but instead he threw me out. <laughs> and he said, I just want to see my wife, go get my wife, go get my wife. So then I walked out and let them still take care of him. And that's from the propofol that they give him to keep him sedated. It causes their mind to kind of go off a little bit too. But anyway, after an hour, I went back in and everything was good. And he was my husband, and today we stand here. Um, that was the one incident, and then you'll, you'll talk about the, the 2014. But anyway, to God be the glory. Well, you know, they say that uh, without blood flow or oxygen in the brain, within seven minutes you receive brain damage. I was more than 15 minutes, so you'll have to ask Miss Dee if I have any brain damage or that not. That would be selective. I can't that would be tell. selective. Well, here's what I did then, May 19th. How many of you know that sometimes bad things will continue to happen to you? How many of you know that the enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour and destroy? On May 19th this past year, I was driving home from the hospital. I finished my last hospital call of the day. I blacked out, ran into two parked cars, thank God, um, but I woke up in an HCMC ambulance on Friday night, and uh, they said, we're going to bring you to the hospital. I said, don't bring me to HCMC on a Friday night. <laughs> bring me to the U of M. So they brought me to the U of M hospital. <clears throat> they had this neck thing on me because I guess the airbag... Uh, banged me up a little bit. No one was injured except for me, thank God. And um, they, they had done x-rays and they said, well, you broke your neck in the best possible place. I said, yeah! <laughs> I always like to do my best for God. And they said, yeah, you broke your neck in the best possible place and we'd like to keep you overnight for observation. I said, oh, no, I heal much better at home, and I sleep better. So, you know, just do my discharge orders. And I'd called Miss Dee uh, when I'd gotten to the emergency room and asked her to meet me at the hospital because I had crashed the car and done some other things, broke my neck. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and so then the doctor leaves and the nurse leaves. So it was only Dee Dee and I in the emergency room. And I looked at Dean and I said, place your hands on my head. And I prayed, God, send your healing power and virtue through Dee's hands and touch my body. And with that, I looked at Dee and I said, I'm not doing good. And I died. I just flatlined. My heart stopped again. And guess what? Miss Dee Dee was there. If she wouldn't have been there, I might not have seen anybody in that little emergency room, my little cubicle, 
for 8, 10 hours. Well, not 8 or 10 hours, but, you know, 8, 10, 15, 20 minutes. So Dee Dee's the one that went out and made the call. He's coded, and she started praying out in the hallway. There's about 35 rooms there in the emergency room. And this other lady poked her head out and said, is that your son? She said, I look so young. <laughs> no, it's my husband. And uh, he said, well, I'm going to start praying with you. So they started praying in tongues. They started casting out, binding things, it, loosening things. It was amazing. While they... Uh, put this machine on me to do the compressions and guess what I woke up in the ICU I was on life support again um, Dee Dee when you tell an Italian what to do they follow through <laughs> so guess what she followed through and um, anyway I, I died on May 19th and they got me revived on May 20th. That's her birthday. So I said, I don't know what I can do for you next year. <laughs> so I'm working on something for her birthday. But you know, God is so great. And God is so mighty. He helps us. But you know what? We have an enemy. And that enemy, well... This is kind of a, I call him the evil devil. Because if you put a D in front of evil, what do you get? The devil. He's the evil devil. And guess what? He's out to, well, he's the father of lies. And you know what he does? He just keeps whispering these things in your ear. And you know what? It's aggravating. And how many of you know that sometimes you start believing those lies? He's the father of lies. He, there's no truth that can come out of this guy's mouth. But guess what? You can, you ever tried to talk without a tongue? You can detongue him. And guess what? He can whisper all those things, but... You're not going to be able to hear it because you have the power over him. Now, guess what? He loves it when you don't pray. But when you pray, you take away some of his power. Every time you pray, the prayer of a righteous man or woman is powerful and effective. And you know what you can do? When you start praying you start taking away all of his power. And I'm here to tell you that you can disarm the devil. You can disarm him. And then guess what? When you go to church, that really gets him going. He doesn't like that. You know why? Because when you go to church, you get encouraged. You get built up. You get taught the word of God. And so he doesn't like it when you go over and meet with other believers. Well, I'm here to tell you that you can defeat the devil. <laughs> you can defeat him. That's right. And... Please don't let any body <laughs> keep you from worshiping and praising the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, King Jesus. Don't let anybody take you away from what that is. And then <laughs> this guy is under your feet. He's under your feet. He has no power. He has no authority. You know, I'm so thankful for this church. I'm thankful for Dr. Lee and for the Reverend Mother. 
I'm so thankful for this praise and worship team that you have. One of them is a homecoming queen. Congratulations. How many of you know that God wants to use us everywhere? Not just here. Everywhere. God wants to use us. You can be a light for him shining in the darkness everywhere you go. Thank you. I sat next to Dr. Ron Canoli Thursday night. He sang his heart out. How many of you have ever heard Ron Canoli, the singer? Two. <laughs> we got to get some more CDs produced or something. He is just a great, great singer, songwriter. You know what? I was more touched by your praise and worship singers and today than, than Brother Ron Canoli when he was ministering. Aren't you glad God uses plain, ordinary people like you and me? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you that you are the God that loves us and cares for us. Lord God, we're thankful that our reservation is already made. That, Lord God, all we have to do is simply check in when it's our time for heaven. Lord God, it's because of our relationship with you, Lord Jesus, the commitment that we've made to you that our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. God, we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Lord, we're thankful that you give us the power and the strength. And your Holy Spirit is our guide. You guide us, you lead us, you direct us. Father in heaven, now we thank you that we can come to you. Lord, we can ask we can seek, we can knock, and that door will be opened unto us. So, Father in heaven, we want you now to minister to us and through us and use us this week. God, don't ever, don't ever leave us, but be with us and help us in the name of Jesus through the power of the blood. Bless your people now, we pray. In the name of Jesus, Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Let's stand together. Mm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We serve a great God. Amen. And the enemy is defeated. Perhaps you are here this morning and you're, you're struggling. Maybe it's a physical thing that's been going on for a long time and you've gotten to the point where you've thought, well, maybe this is just the way that it's supposed to be for me. Maybe this is God's will for me. I believe that God would have you ask for healing. God would have you ask for prayer and see what he does. Give him a chance. Give him a chance to do his work. Maybe it's not physical. Maybe it's another area of your life where you just, you need a touch from God. We're going to pray and we're going to just bless and, and dismiss the service. But if you would like prayer, if you would like Carl and Didi to pray for you, they'll anoint you with oil, they'll minister to you and ask God to do a miracle in your life. And if you'd like a touch from God, if you'd like prayer, then I'm going to invite you to come to the altar and uh, we're going to pray for you. And we're going to believe that God will do a miracle in your life. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you so much for your presence here this morning. We thank you for the message of faith, oh God, that there is nothing that's impossible for God. 
that, Lord, we can celebrate the fact that, that when it's our time to go home, we go home. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, and eternal life lives on. And then there's those other times when that, that beautiful bit of heaven just splashes over right here onto earth and touches us and heals our bodies right here, and heals our lives, gives us answers to the questions that we're groping for. So, Lord, come and do your work. I pray for every person in this room. I pray for every family that is represented here. I plead the blood of Jesus over our homes, over our children, over, Lord God, our lives. Let us go from this place in hope and in strength and in faith. Let us carry that little vial of mustard seeds around and say, I've got this. I can trust God for anything, for anything that I, it comes across my path. For your glory, Lord Jesus, in your precious name, amen.